Good morning. It's so nice to see you all here so early this morning. When we arrived, when I arrived this morning at 6:45, the first words I said was, "I'm thinking next year it's the first annual Women for Women cocktail party." So, but the coffee's now kicked in, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to spend a little bit of time with you. My name is Susan Hodkinson. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Soberman Chartered Accountants. It's my privilege to be your moderator here this morning. Um, we have an unbelievable group of dynamic, engaging, smart, funny, energetic women uh, here this morning, and I'd like to introduce them to you. Dr. Jennifer Blake, 
Dr. Natasha Turner, Dr. Vera Cahoot, and Mary, Allen, Mary Alice Busick. Come on up, ladies. So we surveyed our invitees before we uh, started planning this breakfast, and we asked you what you thought about women's health. And we had about 100 responses. Uh, women were insightful and uh, gracious and honest with their comments. And here's one that really resonated with us. I would really like to have some description of what women go through and experience while we age. What happens? What changes should I expect? What's a normal change? My body's changing, and unlike during puberty, I'm a little unnerved. I can identify with this. I think many of you can. I never know whether I should have this checked or that checked or simply go with the flow, i.e. the decline. <laughs> and although we've learned, although living 6.3 years longer than men, women can only enjoy 1.5 years, more years of disability-free life. So what does all this mean? When we talk about healthy aging, we talk about healthy living. Um, I celebrated a milestone birthday myself this summer, and I, the sentiment in that first slide really does resonate with me, I, I have to tell you. So it seems like a great place to start. So healthy living, healthy aging, what does it look like? Is there a difference? Let's start with uh, Dr. Turner. Tell us what you think about that. Um, I love this topic because I, um, for instance, in my office, I say to a woman, do you have PMS? She says, no. Well, I say, do you have breast tenderness, irritability, mood swings before your period? And she says, well, of course I do. I said, well, you have PMS. So I think what happens is people really don't know what's normal and what's not. And um, when I did the release of my first book, I did Canned AM, and uh, chapters sold out on the very first day, the stock all across the country after I did this interview, because uh, I said, it's all about your hormones. Your hormones are controlling every single aspect of your health from one minute to the next, how your energy is, how your mood is, how your body metabolizes fat, your body composition, your immune system function. And so I said, if you have any one sign or symptom of hormonal imbalance, it means your health isn't optimized. And, she, and then Beverly asked me, well, what are the signs and symptoms of hormonal imbalance? And I said, well, do you feel tired? Do you have difficulty falling asleep? Can you focus? What's your memory like? Do you feel anxious? Do you have food cravings? Um, do you have PMS? Do you have decreased libido? And then everybody, of course, listening said, well, yes, I have all those symptoms. And so <laughs> it was like... I think it was a big thing because people really didn't realize that they had all these health imbalances. And so um, I think one of the most important things you can do for uh, focusing on healthy living is, first of all, pay attention to all the little subtle signs and symptoms that your body's giving you from one day to the next. And it's not normal if you uh, walk in a room and you can't remember why you were there. It's not normal if you have food cravings or if you feel tired after eating. It's not normal if you can't sleep through the night. And these are the little things that plague us on a daily basis. And yet, if you start to pay attention to those things and start to take steps on a daily basis to eliminate those symptoms, you're actually going to create the foundation to age the best that you can age. And so um, what I think are the components of healthy living is first, pay attention. And secondly, um, think about your sleep. Think about your exercise. Think about nutrition. Think about your digestive system. Uh, think about how well things are, are working um, and, and start to do simple things on a daily basis to, to create health in all of these areas. And my first book is actually a six-week plan where you, I basically teach you all those things. I teach you how to sleep, how to eat, how to exercise. And you don't have to rush to do all these things. You implement them slowly over time so that you learn how to do it and it's sustainable because you have to create the habit and then stick with it. It's very interesting. I hear a lot from, from my friends about sleep. And it seems like when we had our pre-discussion from this panel, that kind of theme of sleep and how important healthy sleep is, is it kept coming up over and over again, for sure. It's, um, it's essential. I mean, 74% of us are sleep deprived. And so that means we don't sleep enough. So I don't know how many people sleep seven and a half hours in this room, but that's probably the number you want to strive for. But most of us also don't realize how you sleep. There's actually a proper way to sleep. And I think one thing you might remember today when you leave is that I'm telling you all to sleep in the nude because um, it's very important for your hormonal balance and your metabolism and your wellness to sleep in the nude. Are you writing this down? <laughs> I've had husbands actually say, could you write that down for me? <laughs> yeah. So Dr. Kahoot, let's talk a little bit about normal change. 
Um, you know, it's been said before that one should always look to their mother. Well, you should look to your mother for all kinds of things, which I say to my teenage daughters all the time. But um, I guess that relates to heredity as well. So how is that advice? Tell, tell us about uh, how important that is. I'm going to start off by first of all saying that when we talk about getting older or we talk about aging, everybody suddenly starts to think about all these things that are going to go wrong, right? You're not going to be as beautiful. Your hair is not going to be the same. Your skin your skin's going to get kind of thin and it's going to get all crinkly and everything is going to sag and everything is going to drop. And I'm going to start off by telling you that aging or getting older, which every one of us does every single day of the week, sorry guys, um, is something that is a good thing, okay? And I'm going to talk to you initially about the fact that there are both personal and there are societal benefits to getting older. Go figure. First of all, as we get more mature, we get, with age, comes some sense of perspective. There's a greater sense of wisdom. We are, we're, we're more knowledgeable, we're wiser, we live longer. There's a greater sense of contentment, and you're going to say to me, but I don't feel all that contented, and I'm you know, I'm getting older and I worry more. And I'm going to tell you that the literature says that as you get older, you do get more contented. You actually have a greater sense of satisfaction because you've had some life. You've had some life experience. You have more understanding. You are more positive because you can actually see beyond what's just happening to you in the moment. And there is more need to want to take life on and enjoy it rather than get caught up in all the things that are negative. There's also data out there that says that with that sense of getting older, there's a sense of, of stability. Now, maybe not on a day-to-day -day basis, but in a life gestalt sense, there is more stability. Sometimes it comes in a sense of just feeling that I know who I am more. Sometimes it also comes from a place that, hopefully, for many of us, it may become with greater economic stability as well. It may come from the fact that we have a clearer sense of who we are. It comes from the fact that as we get older, did you know, just a simple fact from a societal standpoint, did you know that up to the age of 75, that we are net providers of care? 75. What does that mean? Well, why are we net providers? We're net providers because we are supporters to our family. We provide financial, practical, emotional assistance to our family in a myriad of ways. From the time when we start those families to when we nurture those families, to when we become caregivers to our parents, to when we become volunteers in society. And by the way, one of the greatest growing areas of society are volunteering. And guess who's doing most of it? As we get older, we tend to do more volunteering, so we tend to pay back to the community. And you know, as we get older, we do another thing. We don't commit as much crime. <laughs> you know, we just, you know, we just don't. You know, we don't get as many traffic tickets. You know, we don't do any of these things. We kind of become more law-abiding citizens. That's not that's such a bad thing from a societal standpoint. And guess what? We also become wiser consumers. And I know that's not always, you know, everybody goes, yeah, but it's the young teens that are consuming all the stuff. But you know what? The consumption that we do societally is actually wiser. It is more beneficial to society. So, hello, ladies. Guess what? With every single day, you are getting better. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I think, I think one of the things that uh, does happen as we get older is we start to feel a little more in control of our lives because we've learned more. And this really goes to one of our questions. We asked, um, we asked our survey respondents, how in control of your, of your health do you feel? And we saw a really a, a fairly interesting significant difference on this. The younger you are, the less in control of your health you feel generally. So fully 20% of our younger respondents said they felt they had no control at all over their health. Whereas the older respondents, the more mature, wiser respondents, potentially, said, you know, most of us said, uh, we, we really feel that we have at least an adequate amount of control or a huge amount of control over our, over our health. So, you know, what are, that's kind of an interesting perspective. And I'm wondering, Mary Alice, if you can speak to us a little bit about what your thoughts are on those, on those results. Yeah, absolutely. At Chalfrey's Drug Mart in 2010, we decided that we would focus on women's health as our core cause. 
and we made a major commitment. We decided that we would put $40 million over the next five years to support women's health and drive advocacy, um, improve empowerment, provide access to resources and other things to support women's health in Canada. Along with that, we conducted a major survey and we spoke to over 1,100 women across Canada. And the results of that survey showed clear differences in how health is perceived as women age, and very similar to what, what Vera spoke about. Um, when you're younger, healthy, being healthy is defined as being physically fit, very much focused around the body and eating healthy. And then as women um, have children, health is really defined as being free of disease because women want to be able to care for, for their dependents and they no longer put their health as the top priority. Their health becomes a distant second to the health of the dependents. That has big, a big impact on how they view health. And then as Vera was saying, as women age, so the more mature women when they age 55 and older, they feel much more in control of their health and they're focused more on living disease-free and being able to do their daily tasks. So with that, um, you see a, a real change or a shift in how in control people are. And younger and older feel much more in control. And that in between, particularly when you're taking care of dependents, you are hanging on by your fingernails. You're just, just uh, getting by. You're focused solely on the health of, uh, of the people that you're caring for, whether that's spouse, children, aging parents. And that's why a big part of our focus at Shoppers Drug Mart has been uh, providing information and easy solutions to help women going through that. And that's a number of the partnerships that we're supporting really focus on those areas. It's interesting. Another, um, one of the commonalities in terms of our survey, um, while there were age differences with respect to the respondents on control um, issues, uh, there was one that seemed to be consistent across the board, and it was all about the weight. And I think you can't get a group of women together without, you know, identifying that everyone wants to be a little thinner or maybe not a little bigger, but mostly a little thinner. And I can tell you that from my own perspective, you know, we all have that set point. We all have that point on the scale where we go, oh, my God, that set point seems to be creeping up over the years for me. And I think I think it creeps up over the years for, for many of us. I'm actually going to put Dr. Blake on the spot a little bit here and ask you in your practice how much do you hear this? Do you hear this sort of concern about weight? And you know, what, what kind of advice do you actually give? We're going to have all of our, our panelists weigh in, weigh in, no pun intended, on this weighty topic. But uh, how much do you hear this? And what do you say? It, it's a constant theme. And it's, and it's a very important one. And if we look at the, the data that we know about Canada, and there's actually last year, uh, we released, or the, the government released a, a, a survey that was done of Canadian adults. And since 1982, what I can tell you about Canadian women is our average height is still five foot four inches, but we are 12 pounds heavier. Um, and men are even worse in terms of they haven't gotten any taller, but they've gotten on average uh, 15 pounds heavier. And, and along with that, our fitness has gone down. Uh, some of this is clearly diet, and uh, probably the most important thing is, there's two parts to that, not only what we eat, but how we eat, and there's no question when I talk to my patients about meal times, people, the sit-down family dinner is, is um, rare, and I think it's really important that we get back down to proper eating habits. Our bodies will adapt. If our bodies think we're starving all the time, our bodies are going to hang on to every calorie we give them. And regular meal times actually are the starting point. And then it's what we eat, uh, which is a whole other topic. But it's the balance. It's also what we do. Uh, we, our bodies were made to work, and our bodies were made to expend energy. And if we're not expending that energy, it's going to sit on our hips. And stress increases the fact that, that weight stays with us. So it's not a simple matter of going on a diet. It's actually our entire life that we have to reassess to actually achieve healthy weight and, and good health. Um, the scale is a small part of that equation. Absolutely. Vera, what do you have? Uh, we, were, we were chatting about exercise and how much we love our exercise. Um, but, but talk to us a little bit about how you see the, um, the perspectives on exercise change 
as women go through the various stages in their life. I know, you know, we, we talk about this all the time. It's supposed to, you know, make time for exercise and do all those other kinds of things. And why is it so hard for us all the time? And, you know, how do we do it? So if you want to hear some, some quotes, so your guidelines are that you're supposed to get 150 minutes of cardiovascular exercise every week. And if we kind of break that down, that's 30 minutes five times a week. And you're going to say to me, and I don't have 30 minutes. And I'm going to say to you, okay, you don't have 30 minutes. That's not good. Um, but maybe you might want to hear this. There was a study that was done recently that basically said that even if you did 15 minutes. Now, if you tell me you don't have 15 minutes, I have a huge problem with that. <laughs> but you have 15 minutes of good, brisk, healthy, sweat-producing walking or some kind of an exercise of that kind, and it does have an impact on prolonging your life. In fact, the study suggested that even extra three years of life was given if you did that over time. There was a study that was done at Duke University, and Duke showed that it, it does matter the kind of exercise you do. So cardiovascular exercise is really great at taking down body fat. And you're gonna say to me, well, I can go out there and, and I can train and I can make sure that I get my body fat down and I'm gonna get it down off of that hip because that's really where I want it down. And I'm gonna say to you, there's no such thing as targeted weight loss, okay? It's all about when you're exercising, it all comes off. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing cardiac exercise, it loves coming off the middle first. Hello, guess where all the cardiovascular symptoms are? Guess where all the cardiovascular risks are for blood pressure, diabetes, for um, all of those things? They're sitting right here between your armpits and down to your hip bone. That's a really important place to not have so much weight. If you do cardiovascular exercise, it helps take that off better. You will take it off everywhere, but you will take it off there better. If you do weight training, you will take off subcutaneous fat. That's the stuff that sits here, okay? That's good too, because it's nice to have muscle definition, right? We all want it, but that works. So exercise is really great. And it's also really important when you do it. It's better that you do it in the morning, if you can. Why? Because it sets you up for the day. It helps you burn calories. It gives you all of this energy. It makes you feel better. And so it's really great to do it. But if you can't do it in the morning, just do it. That's all. Just do As it. Nike would say. Yeah. Natasha, how about the effect of hormones on weight control? You've talked a little bit about that, but hormones, nutrition, that combination? Um, I, I just know from personal experience it isn't all about diet and exercise. I developed a, a deficiency of thyroid hormone in, in 1993, and I was exercising an hour a day and watching what I was eating, and yet I still gained 25 pounds. So um, I think the new formula for weight loss, I think that the calories in minus calories out is antiquated. I, I, I don't think it is about that anymore. Um, and I see... Uh, patient after patient in my office with the frustration of trying to do everything right and they're just not getting results. And especially perimenopausal, menopausal women, they're so frustrated with the continuous ab fat no matter how many um, cardio classes they do or, or how well they're, they're watching their diet. And it has absolutely everything to do with your hormones. Your hormones are controlling your appetite, your cravings, how your body responds to exercise, where you store your fat uh, is dictated by your hormones. So um, I think that you have to optimize your hormonal balance. And the tricky thing is, is that everything you do, think, say, or feel impacts your hormones. So you have to think about creating a balanced approach, just like, um, you know, it isn't, it isn't just about your diet and your exercise. And so you have to think about all the components that impact your metabolism because they impact your hormones. But then also focus on um, healthy weight loss, when I don't, I think it's, we all get so stuck up on the scale and you really need to be looking at how much muscle you have, how, what your percentage of body fat, what your weight is and what your waist to hip ratio is. It's all of those things. Uh, it's not just the number on the scale. Um, and we do get to gain an extra 1% of body fat every decade, not every year, it's every decade. So, so I'm good till I'm about 90 then. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done. Okay. Um, but I think that um, if, you're, if you're trying to think about weight loss, 
Um, I think the number one most important thing you need to do is think about balancing insulin because insulin is the only hormone that is always telling your body to store energy as fat. Um, and we do a lot of things every day that trigger the release of a lot of this hormone. So we choose the wrong types of carbohydrates. We choose, um, we're deficient in fiber, we're deficient in protein. Uh, we consume artificial sweeteners. Um, and all of these things raise insulin. So if right. you eat at the same time every day, you will have lower insulin levels. If you consume protein every single time you eat, every meal and snack, you will have lower insulin levels. If you build more muscle, you will have lower insulin levels. We all lose muscle as we age, and I, this might get a bit controversial, but I actually think that it's more important to focus on strength training than cardiovascular exercise, and I heavily promote circuit training. So. If you do circuit training in the sense that you do one exercise to the next, to the next, to the next, and you're done within 30 minutes, I don't promote exercising longer than that because we don't need to because otherwise you'll raise your stress hormones, which tears down your muscle fiber. But if you do high-intensity circuit training for 30 minutes three times a week and cardiovascular exercise, you know, 15, 10 to 15 minutes of interval training, you will build muscle, and that means you'll continue to burn fat, more fat even when you're sleeping. So stress, I heard that stress word, um, and I want to move on to that. We, uh, interestingly enough, when we survey people, and this, we see, see this in this survey, and, and even in common conversation, you know, people talk about, um, you know, well, I have no, you know, issue with respect to mental illness or anything like that. And then you say, well, are you stressed? And they say, oh, I'm really stressed. So I don't know what you know that that is. I'm depressed. I'm stressed. And as as a business leader, um, one of the things that we look at every year is we look at all of our costs. We look at our uh, at our, um, our our health plans, and we look at we get a summary of the kinds of prescriptions that our health care our health plan is paying for. And without a doubt, year after year after year, in our environment, the professional services environment, antidepressants are the number one prescribed drug, and it's not just Soberman. It's all over the place <laughs> so before you say it. So what's that all about? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, um, are there better ways for us to deal with stress? I suspect that there'll be, maybe there'll be some uh, discussion on this, but, you know, I've seen this now for probably 15 years. So increasingly, you know, everybody's on something because everyone's stressed and depressed. So... What's our solution to that? You've got 15 minutes to fix all that. So <laughs> over to you. How about, Archie, why don't we start with Dr. Blake? Oh, I, I, well, I agree. I think we're seeing a huge amount of, of uh, antidepressants being prescribed. But I think that we've seen women being medicated for, uh, for anxiety and, and depression for years. When I started my training, women were all being given Valium. Uh, we're changing our drug of, of choice. Uh, but women are being given drugs, um, and and I and I must say it's not it's not something that I'm uh, happy to see, and um, and and it's not part of my practice actually to be prescribing them, but I do see uh, see the problem, and I and I think it comes back to uh, you have to feel that your life is fulfilling in some way, and I think that that it's we we are actually any of us who are sitting in this room right now are pretty privileged. And, uh, and we have to step back and look at the big picture and, and realize that and, and um, actually take time to take stock. And I don't have an easy answer to make people find meaning and value in their lives, but you've got to find it. it, it you have to say that somehow that, that you've, you've, you've kept your eye on the balance and the core of, of what gives your day meaning and why you go to work and what brings you home at night and, and what what is making you feel that your life has meaning? Um, this this search for meaning and the emptiness that you see in people who feel that their lives don't have it, I think you can't fix with a pill. Um, we have a lot of other women whose lives are incredibly stressed because of poverty or socioeconomic situations or because they live in violence or because they have been brought up in, in uh, situations that are, are very unstable. Um, a pill's not going to fix those. These are much bigger um, social problems. And so I think that, that the, the, I'm not going to give a simple answer to, to the depression question as much as to say I think that, that we have to use our positions of 
of privilege to be able to advocate and try to improve conditions for people in all aspects. And, and, and it's, it's, there's something in it for all of us to have a society that actually lets people feel that their lives are more meaningful and that they are a little bit safe and more secure. So is that, a, is that an answer? That's a good answer. Vera, <laughs> I see you nodding. I, I mm -hmm. totally agree. Um, the issues that, that Jenny has raised are, are, are huge, um, and we are privileged group that are sitting out here. Um, but I think it's also important to, to recognize that, that stress is, is uh, by itself, okay, is a, a state that allows us to develop resilience. Now, you're going to say to me, oh yeah, sure, when I feel stressed, I don't feel very resilient. But there's lots of data out there that says that stress, okay, provided it has not overcome you, is something that allows you to develop resilience in life. And it's part of the reason why when we get older, we are better at managing stress because we've had some practice. Now, what is also very true is that it is the perception of how much stress that you have in your life that is actually crucial. So when Nelson Mandela, God bless him, sat in jail for many years and in isolation in one cell, he was stressed to the max. However, he found a place inside himself where he could find strength and where he continued to find things that were important for his own survival and his sense of well-being. And so I use that as an example because here's someone who was stressed, who was being beaten, who was that, and yet somewhere within himself there was an internal resilience. And then it's up to us to try and find that internal resilience. And if we're having trouble finding it, then we need to get some help. And we need to do things that help our internal resilience. We need to get that sleep. We need to make sure that we eat properly. We need to make sure that we exercise. We need to reach out to each other when we are stressed and look for social support. Women do that so very, very well. And we should make sure that we do that on an ongoing basis. And if you had nothing else that you could do that makes a difference, then in your stress levels, then do two things. One, socialize. It's a big deal. And two, get some exercise. And I don't, you know, I agree. I agree with Natasha. There are many ways to exercise. And what Natasha was talking about, when you're talking about different kinds of exercise, yes, they're all there. And they're all important. And when you look at the facts out there, that exercise probably has the most immediate benefits because it hits both at weight and it hits at the stress response. Remember, when you are stressed, okay, your pituitary gland sends messages, and it sends messages out to your body, and one of the things that happens when you are stressed is that your cortisol levels, you know, increase. Now, we're not talking pathology, we're talking within the range of normal, but what happens is when you are stressed, there's actually a mechanism in your body that makes you put on fat. And guess what? You never put it on on your thighs, really. You actually put it on in this core area. So there is some data to suggest that stress is associated with weight gain. And in fact, when you are stressed, other things happen. You probably don't take as good care of yourself. You probably remove yourself from the world and you actually isolate. Maybe you get into bad behaviors. Maybe you actually eat the wrong kinds of food. Maybe you stop becoming physically active. So it is a gestalt of state, okay? And so it is associated then with a sense of fatigue, of being overwhelmed, of not having enough energy to do things. And you're going to say to me, well, how is that different from depression? And I'm going to say to you, depression is a clinical diagnosis. It is a state of being that is related to changes in your brain. And it manifests itself as a sense of feeling hopeless, as a sense of being pessimistic about what it is that your life is all about, about a loss of, act, of interest in activities that normally would please you. And then in addition to that, 
there are other manifestations. So that, yes, there may be times when it feels like it's similar, but from a medical standpoint, they are two totally different things. And yes, if you get stressed long enough, and if you don't cope, and you don't have the internal and external resources to support you, there is no question that life can become very difficult and you can get depressed. And if that's the case, and it is a clinical state, and it is meets the criteria of depression, then depression it is, and it can be treated. I think that's a tremendous point. I, I certainly um, have done a little bit of work with mental health advocacy in, in the past, and I think one of the things that happens sometimes is that people who who genuinely have that medical diagnosis, in fact, don't seek the help that they otherwise should because there's this kind of, you should just be able to feel happy and pull yourself out of it. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, so, so not to be, uh, to be, to take the idea of, of the, uh, you know, medical interventions lightly, definitely. And I, could, I think that, that that was really, really well said there, that depression is an illness, depression is not normal, and depression needs to be treated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we now have, um, Im imaging evidence, the brain actually changes with mm -hmm. chronic depression. And when people talk about being in a rut, well, your brain actually gets ruts. Uh, it, it, there is, there is, and I think that for those of you who have teenagers or children, really critical that be on the watch for, for children. Depression in children can be a dangerous thing because they don't know what's happening to them, and they can do rash things. So uh, depression is serious. Depression is not your everyday... I'm feeling stressed out, I'm feeling tired, I'm feeling fatigued. There, there are lots of things that we can do collectively and individually for that, but depression we have to take seriously. Yes, I, 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 mm -hmm. I echo that um, because the, there are some beautifully elegant studies out there now that literally have shown that when you are depressed, your brain looks different. We're not talking stress. We're mm -hmm. talking the brain really is different. There are changes in brain function with depression. Um, so that's that's important. And there's also yes, the far-reaching effects of depression. We know there's increased risk of heart disease, increased risk of cancer, increased risk of Alzheimer's. So it's recognizing the depression now and then thinking about the long term. I think it's probably the number one health concern mm -hmm. along with the um, pre-diabetes and diabetes management. I think those are the two biggest things we're going to have to deal with. I would agree, and I actually think it's a business. It's a it's a fairly sizable business concern as well, yeah. in terms of lost productivity, et cetera. So, let's move. We could we could have an entire weekend symposium on that topic. So let's let's move move ahead. The other another issue uh, that was reflected in our in our survey is uh, women's reproductive health issues. So hormonal changes. Um, in my at my time of life, we like to refer to it on occasion as having your own private summer every once in a while. Um, and this is, you know, there's lots of discussions when you get to my age with your friends about how you deal with this. Um, and I would love to hear from each of our panelists, actually, um, with respect to your views on, uh, on hormonal changes, HRT, how to, how to treat, and what we now know about this that we might not have known about um, you know, when our mothers were going through this. So maybe we'll start with Dr. Blake. Well, I'm going to start off by asking, um, show of hands or stand up. You've been sitting for a while. Stand up. Stand up if you've had a hot flash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now, if you're having one now, do this. If, if, if your hot flashes have come from PMS, uh, no, stay standing, stay standing. If your hot flashes have come from PMS or from panic attacks or from medication or from cancer treatment, you can sit down. And if your hot flashes are from menopause, you can stay standing. And, and for those women who are, have who've had menopause hot flashes, if you find them really... Um, Pleasant, warm, comfortable, toasty, like, you know, just like, like that nice feeling you get when you gather around a campfire, you can sit down. <laughs> um, and for the rest of you, if, if, if you don't mind them, you know, you know, they happen and they're absolutely no big deal, you can sit down. And if you find them uncomfortable or unpleasant or you wish they'd go away, stay standing. Um, and, and thank you. And I think that the issue is that, you know, you can all sit down now. Um, hot flashes, uh, 
are, are, are made jokes of. And we mm -hmm. call you know, your personal summer. Um, many of you, some of you might remember Archie Bunker's wife, Edith, and her hot flashes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what we know now is that hot flashes come from deregulation of our body's temperature sensing mechanisms. Our bodies monitor temperature. If our children are sick, what's the first thing we do? We stick a thermometer in their mouth. Uh, body temperature is essential. We run, our bodies run on chemistry, and all chemical reactions happen within a very narrow temperature range. If we get too cold, they slow right down and stop. If we get too hot, they stop working and we die of hypothermia. Um, and it turns out that we're much more sensitive to things that push our temperature up than push our temperature down. Uh, I think, so when we're young, we have a sort of like a U-shaped cross of what's a normal body temperature from, you know, we're a little cold to a little hot, we're, and we actually feel fine in that time. With menopause, it becomes this little tippy V and we're too hot, too cold, too hot, too cold, and then we get these flashes. And women who have hot flashes will also tell you that after the hot flash comes the cold chill. And that's why jackets go off and on and off and on. And that's why men, by the way, have hot flashes, because at night the covers go off, and they land on the husband. <laughs> and then he gets hot, then you get the chill, and you pull all the covers back, and then you're frozen. So, so it, there, is, there is justice in the world. Um, <laughs> now, why they come with menopause, we don't know, but they do. And at the same time that women are experiencing hot flashes, uh, what we know is that temperature, that, that normal level of, of temperature regulation disappears to zero. So uh, we, we really are impaired. And our body is really thrown off by this because our body is constantly monitoring to make sure that our temperature is normal. We wear clothes, we heat buildings, we do all of these things to try to create a, a constant temperature environment for our bodies. Now you're feeling hot and you're looking around and everyone else is wearing their jackets and their scarves and you're thinking, what's wrong with me? Am I sick? And you probably don't verbalize that, but in the brain, when you're having a hot flash, the anxiety centers are lighting up. And that's why we don't feel hot flashes are normal and none of those other circumstances where we have them, like cancer and its treatment or these things, PMS, they're not normal states either. So uh, hot flashes are, are more than just an, an inconvenience. They're, they're destabilizing kind of an experience for women. And, uh, and maybe I'll say enough and we can talk about treatments, but I think the first thing is to understand that they are physiologic. And even though they tend to get better and it takes about five years for most of the symptoms to pass, we know that women into their 70s and 80s, and my mom who's 91, um, still has hot flashes. Natasha, any suggestions? Um, yes. <laughs> Whether you're concerned with menopause or improving your fertility, I think you can use um, uh, the approach that I, I put in the second book. The, this is a 30-day plan to restore your hormonal health. And how it works is you start out first by thinking about improving your, removing any foods that could be causing allergies. So gas, bloating, headache, fatigue, triggering inflammation because inflammation triggers the stress response which could then trigger and aggravate hot flashes. You also want to remove foods that can cause hot flashes and hormonal imbalance, so alcohol, caffeine, sugar. Um, and doing work to focus on the liver, because your liver is the organ that breaks down and eliminates hormonal waste. So many perimenopausal, menopausal women um, and women concerned with fertility, their overall health and hormonal state improves by giving gentle herbs to help support the breakdown and elimination of harmful, toxic estrogen. Um, which is important for both younger women and older women. Um, older women, the more body fat you have, the more harmful estrogen your body produces, the greater your risk of, of breast cancer. Younger women, um, higher amounts of harmful estrogen increase risk of dif difficulty conceiving. So I start with, with focusing on your diet and your liver function first and also using natural sleep aids if, if necessary because um, again, if you sleep less than seven and a half hours and you wake up in the morning, you're going to be waking up with higher amounts of cortisol, which is your, high, your stress hormone that we've been talking about. So pretty hard to restore balance if you're not doing that. Um, and then at the end of the 30 day, then you have to think about eating for hormonal balance. So eating the right foods at the right times and in the right combinations. If you skip meals, 
if you eat too late, uh, close to bedtime, all these types of things will cause more hormonal disruption, increased risk of hot flashes at night. That was part of the reason why I want you to sleep in the noon, because you should be cooling down when you sleep. If you sleep in tight-fitting clothing or with heavy blankets, or if you eat too close to bedtime, it raises your body temperature, which upsets your hormones. Um, at the end of that, when you learn the foundation, the basics of health, that's when I think you should start to consider using natural things to improve your hormonal balance if you need it. So do you still have hot flashes at the end of the 30 days? Um, do you still have poor memory? Do you still have more anxiety? Then you can use herbs. You can use supplements. You could use bioidentical hormone replacement um, if necessary, I think. But I encourage you to do all those other things first because I have a lot of women that come to my office and they want, I want hormone replacement. Well, I, I think sometimes you can do so much with lifestyle um, and natural, natural remedies. And then if you do have to use hormone replacement, you can use it in lower amounts and in lower dosages. And you want to make sure that your body's going to metabolize that hormone replacement and get rid of it properly. So for instance, if you're constipated and you're taking in estrogen every single day, your estrogen is broken down and eliminated through the bowel. Well, if you're not having a bowel movement every day, you're accumulating that estrogen, not eliminating it. It's increasing your risk of breast cancer. So You've really got to think holistically. This is very important. I think I, I, I will like to move ahead to our next topics. We have two more topics we'd love to, and I think the two of them um, could, could be related. Cancer, um, you know, cancer, all cancers. Um, a, a huge concern to everyone who responded to, to our survey. Um, we know that um, breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer death um, among women between the ages of 30 and 49. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths among women over 50. Uh, skin cancer is a leading cause of death in young women. So, uh, you know, we've learned a lot about cancer, uh, but we clearly haven't learned enough. And uh, Vera and I were having a quick chat in the, uh, in the, in the green room back there uh, before we started. And, and, uh, but before we talk a little bit about that, I'd love to hear from Mary Alice. Uh, Mary Alice, as we mentioned in the introduction, was the, um, the uh, lead honorary chair for the Weekend 10 Women's Cancers um, Weekend this year. Um, I was also fortunate enough to be an honorary chair, and we had uh, a team of sober men women uh, and some friends uh, walking in the, uh, in the 35K walk uh, this year. And uh, you can read about all that, actually, in our latest issue of comments, which you can pick up on the way out. Um, Mary Alice, I'd love to. I've been involved in this. I'm a cancer survivor 10 years and uh, I've been involved in the walk since the very beginning. It's a tremendous uh, initiative, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your commitment to that, your personal commitment, and Shoppers Drug Mart's commitment as well. Great. First off, congratulations on surviving cancer. Thank you. I'm also a survivor of cancer. At the age of 26, I was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer that at the time that I was born, women were still dying of that cancer. Today, it's considered a treatable and, and curable cancer. And not only am I passionate about it, Shoppers Drug Mart is very passionate about cancer. One of the reasons we've chosen cancer as a key cause for us to uh, get behind is because when we surveyed those 1,100 women, um, what came across as the number one fear, health fear for women, was cancer. Even though it's, it's a distant um, risk for many women, it is by far the number one fear. So it's important to women, it's important to us. And three of the key initiatives and programs that we've undertaken at Shoppers Drug Mart are related to cancer. The first one is uh, Facing Cancer, which is um, an online community to provide women advice, feedback, and a forum on how to face, how to deal with the effects of cancer. Um, the other one is uh, Look Good, Feel Better. So when women are dealing with with um, cancer, how to feel good about themselves and how to deal with the physical effects of cancer and, and again, a community of support. And then what you talked about, which is uh, the weekend walk to end women's cancers, and, and that is by far the biggest commitment that we've made um, with uh, the five walks across Canada, the biggest one by far in, Can in uh, Toronto, um, to raise money to uh, conduct further research improve access to care, and um, provide, um, provide care and special support to those who, um, who, who need that to, from a financial standpoint. So, so that's a very significant focus for us, and we're going to expand that commitment over the, the coming years. So 
Um, so that's fantastic to hear that you're mm -hmm. going to be out on the walk. I would encourage all of you, we've got a brochure in your bag about the different programs that we support, and there's information there about the weekend to end women's cancers. I would encourage all of you to consider coming out next year to do the walk. And, and I wanted to talk a, a, a little bit as well, and I have Vera speak specifically about um, you know, what we've learned about cancer. And, and it's interesting, having, having been involved in this for, for a long time, we've raised a lot of money. And um, my daughters are, are 17 and 20 now. They were uh, nine and seven, whatever, when I, when I was diagnosed. And um, I remember my, a couple of years ago, my younger daughter at, at sort of 12 or 13, I said something about doing the walk. And she said, have they not cured it yet? You know, she said, you've raised all this money. And, and, and you know, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, first of all, it's exceedingly complicated. Um, but it, but I, the example that I used for her, and I, I thought we could use as a quick jumping off point for Vera, is that when I was diagnosed 10 years ago, the treatment, if I had been diagnosed with the same pathology or the same, the same stage of cancer 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I probably would not have been treated the way I was. Similarly, if as somebody was diagnosed today with the pathology that I had 10 years ago, they wouldn't have been treated the way I was 10 years ago. So we, we learn, and the reason we learn is, is through these kinds of issues with respect to research, et cetera. So, so Vera, maybe you can talk a little bit about current breast cancer screening guidelines, um, genetic testing, genotyping, that, that kind of thing. What are we seeing now that's different, and where do you think it's going? I can help. Let's go back. We might toss that one back and forth a little bit. <laughs> um, okay, so first of all, what is cancer? Okay, we talk about it all the time, right? Well, cancer is a disease um, that, uh, of cells, and cells have things in them called genes, and genes tell cells what to do. And so in a cancer, the orders that come from the gene to the cell get kind of mixed up. The normal messages to grow, to reproduce, are altered, okay? And so very generic. It's probably not entirely accurate, but it's a good enough picture, right? And we talk about the kind of cancers that are, are uh, the top leading causes, and we talked about some of the ones that Susan just mentioned, but I wanted to let you know that the top five cancers, okay, for 2011 are lung, are breast, are colorectal, okay, are pancreas, and ovary. The melanomas we're seeing in the young kids, okay, and in young women. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. Lung cancer, is there a screening tool? Well, unfortunately, the data out there says not really. You can do chest x-rays, but chest x-rays have not been shown, okay, to decrease the risk of dying from lung cancer. There is some data out there on people who smoke, okay, and there are lung cancers that come from smoking, and there are lung cancers that come in a group of that are, are non-smokers, and they're actually genetically different. But in the smoking group of women, there is some data now that low-dose CT scan screening has actually had an impact on the diagnosis of these cancers sooner, and in fact, there has been some um, prolongation of life. However, there is no recommendation out there right now to do low-dose CT screening on all smokers. I need to make that very clear. What about breast? Well, we have mammography. We have breast exams, okay? And those should be done routinely on women as they get over the age of 40. We stop talking about self-examination as a constant tool for women. Why? Because in younger women, it can lead to a lot of anxiety and finding things. But as we get older, we do need to be aware of what's going on in our breast. And, there is, and the recommendation has been to start mammography at 50. Now, if you are belonging to a high-risk group, then the recommendation has been to start sooner. And we can, you can always talk to your family doctor about that. And so there are guidelines around that. What about things like colorectal cancer? Yes, of course there's screening. And we should be screened. And the guidelines are you start screening at 50. And if you have a positive family history, you start 10 years before the earliest diagnosis of colorectal cancer in the family. Okay, and we can talk about that. What about pancreatic cancer? Well, I'm sorry, but there really isn't anything out there as a screening test for pancreatic cancer. However, we do know that there are 
linkages between different kinds of diseases and pancreatic cancer. So there are linkages between breast cancer and pancreatic cancer. There are linkages that we can find, and those have been found in groups, and they are being monitored. So asymptomatic screening, having everybody have ultrasounds of their belly to look for breast cancer is not recommended. What about ovarian cancer? There is no screening for asymptomatic women, okay? If you have no symptoms, having pelvic ultrasounds is not the thing to do. Having blood tests to screen for ovarian tumors in an asymptomatic woman is not the thing to do. I am not talking about the woman who has a high familial risk of ovarian cancer. That's a different category, and that requires a different kind of monitoring system. But these are the top five cancers that affect women. When it comes to melanomas and when it comes to skin cancer, the skin cancers that we're seeing, okay, we're seeing them in young women. We're seeing them, why? Because they're having excess exposure to ultraviolet radiation. One of the biggest issues out there is tanning beds. There's data out there that says that, interestingly enough, as moms or as future moms, remember you model your daughters, so moms that use tanning beds have kids that use tanning beds. And guess what? They all have increased risk for skin cancer. Tanning beds are bad. Okay, what should you do? Stay away from being in the sun. Okay, have you ever noticed the new starlets that are new stars that are coming out? Anne Hathaway, do you see much brown on her? No, she's pale. It's okay. It's good for you. Okay, it does not sun, especially between the hours of 11 and 4 o'clock, where it's at its peak, contains a lot of ultraviolet radiation. You don't need it. Yes, you do need some sun exposure every day, and yes, you should have some of it. And yes, you take vitamin D in the years, in the time when you don't have sun exposure. That's, to say, that's, that's a known fact. But understand that tanning beds and large amounts of sun exposure are bad for you. The ultraviolet rays do injure your skin. So use sunscreen, stay away from the sun from 11 to 4, keep covered, wide brimmed hats, lots of nice big sunglasses, okay, and take your vitamin D so that you have a little bit of that sunshine hormone. So that's some of the things. We can talk about it in more detail. Please. And if I, if I could add to, to that, for women under the age of 44 in Canada, the, the second most common cancer is, does anyone know? It's cancer of the cervix. And this is Cervical Cancer Awareness Week. And so if you have not had your pap smear done, please leave this meeting and go uh, this morning, make an appointment to get your pap smear done. It is the second most common cause of cancer. And while we are able to, with pap smears, detect a lot of early cancers and treat them, uh, I, I look after women who have had cervical cancer and, and they have lost their fertility. Often they've lost their sexual function because of the, the treatment for cervical cancer and it doesn't always work. Um, it, is, it is not an innocuous disease, and, it, and we do need to screen. And if you have uh, sons or daughters, or if you yourself are um, in, not in a, in a settled relationship, think about HPV vaccination, which is extremely effective at reducing uh, the risk not only of cervical cancer, but also of other HPV-related cancers, including anal cancer and oral pharyngeal cancer, and in, and in men, uh, penile cancers, as well as we can also control 90% of genital warts. So uh, Cervical Cancer Awareness Week is this week. Um, it's, we can do something about it. Terrific. I want us to have five minutes for questions, so I'm going to move to, to sort of a wrap-up topic a little for each of our panelists. Um, we, one of the things that we learned from our, uh, from our respondents was that approximately 65% of you um, rely only on your family physician for medical care. And, and one of the things we hear a lot about now is uh, advocating for yourself in the health system, but also having a circle of care. So approaching health care uh, in, in a holistic way, you know, recognizing that there's lots and lots that, uh, that, that to deal with, you know, in the same way that you have a circle of, of 
hair in terms of the hair and the, that's the other thing that happens when you get older. Your team just gets bigger, the hair and the nails, the trainer, et cetera. Um, but I'd love to hear from each of our panelists, maybe we'll start with Mary Alice and move down. Um, who, should, who should be in your circle of care? Who, who are the most important, uh, what, are, what are the pieces in that circle of care in order for you to be getting the kind of health uh, care that we really need? That's right. Our research said the same thing. Women are increasingly looking at their health more broadly than just their body, mind, spirit, and body, and are looking more broadly for care in that circle of care. Um, obviously, pharmacists have been around for a long time, and the role that pharmacists play in that circle of care is increasingly important um, for a number of reasons. One is easy access to, um, to care. So pharmacists are available in most cases um, in communities, can be over hours, especially in um, rural communities where there may be difficulty with doctor access um, or urgent care facilities. Pharmacists are often the most referred to um, healthcare professional in those areas. So, so that's a, a key factor in Canada. Um, the other one is that in conjunction with the doctor, a pharmacist can, can work to ensure that the um, course of treatment is the right course of treatment for an individual based on their lifestyle, based on other aspects of other care that they may be receiving. There are also significant implications from um, uh, drug um, interactions with other drugs, but also with other supplements, with other food or other regimens that somebody may be following, and a, a pharmacist can be very supportive in consultation on that. Um, so. So the role of the pharmacist is increasing in that circle of care. And I'll pass it over to you. Um, I agree. So we have a team, and we need to use them. If you have a family doctor, use. If your family doctor is part of a family health group, there's often a nurse practitioner in it. That's a very valuable resource. The nurse in your doctor's office is a valuable resource. Your pharmacist is a valuable resource. There are terrific websites out there that are valuable resources. Many of you will have a gynecologist. That's another, value. That's another valuable resource. If you use a naturopath, okay, understand that a naturopath's role is to help you with your preventative care as well as your sense of well-being. You use that individual as a resource and toss questions off. Your job is to take care of yourself. And you do that by becoming aware. And you do that by checking out with the people that you turn to to see if the information that you are getting is useful, valid, credible, research-based. And that's what these providers are there for, to guide you through the miasm of information that's out there on the internet. Mm -hmm. And there's both good and bad information. And it's important to use your team to do that. Make your appointments, for example, with a physician, because I'm going to speak as a physician. When you make your appointments, think about what you want to do on that appointment. Come with a list, if you're going to have a list, and we hate lists, but come with a list anyway. Let us know at the beginning what it is that you want us to talk about. And then we'll probably try and identify the key things that we can cover in a visit. We, you may have 20 questions, but I'm going to tell you, we may not be able to answer 20 questions. But we may be able to prioritize the top three, and then let's work our way through them, okay? Understand what it is that you're asking, and come prepared to listen, and come prepared to ask questions. It's a big deal. Natasha? Um, I always tell patients what the work they do with me is what they do to maintain and optimize their health in between their annual checkups with their medical doctor. So I have the luxury of time of teaching people the tools and the, the habits that they need to, to ensure that they stay healthy. Um, so I think that that's very, very, very important. I help people optimize their health, but I also help people be proactive rather than reactive. So I think one of the most important things that any of us can do is to get pro preventative medical testing done every single year. Go for your blood tests every single year and know what to ask for. Um, I've included a chapter on blood tests on every single one of my books because I think it's incredibly empowering if you know what to ask for. If you know the risk, the risk factors for heart disease, for diabetes, um, and you know what the optimal values are. 
I cannot, I had one person come in one time, he threw his binder at me from MedCan, and he said, I have diabetes. I have been to my medical doctor every single year for the last 15 years, and there's never been anything, any mention of anything wrong. How could I be diabetic from one year to the next? And it's because there's a progression of normal. Your fasting blood sugar normal ranges from four to six. Well, optimal is five. So one year you're five, one then next year you're 5.2, and then you're 5.8, and then you're 5.7, and then you're 5.9. Well, you need to know what optimal is and to to take steps when you start to see you slip out of optimal because you don't, you want to maintain optimal health. You don't want to sit back and go, oh, you're normal, you're normally normal, and now all of a sudden you're not normal. So mm -hmm. no, go for pro proactive medical testing. In include your medical doctor and naturopathic doctor in your health team I think is absolutely essential. Um, and that's where naturopathic medicine excels. We help you in the range where you're starting to slip and be out of optimal, right? Um, and I think one of the most important things you could do to absolutely change your life is to learn how to exercise properly. So maybe you can't afford a personal trainer all the time, but if you could have three or four sessions with someone that could assess your body, show you the type of exercise that you can do in 30 minutes or, or, or 20 or 30 minutes or less and do it without the risk of injury or ex increasing stress on your body, um, I, I really believe that that's probably one of the best investments you could do is, is, is invest in learning how to exercise properly. Great advice. Thank you. Right. Well, so much has been covered, and I just want to say, Mary Alice, I'm the, I'm the chair of the Medical Advisory Committee for the Look Good, Feel Better Foundation, and on behalf of that, really want to thank Shoppers for the help you've given us with facing cancer. That this is just women helping women to get through some really uh, stressful, difficult challenges with cancer. So we can help each other a lot. But the, the, I think the place that I'm, I'm going to put my emphasis today is what we can do to make a healthy workplace. Um, and, I'm, and I'm recalling back when I started into medical school, if you were a woman and you were uh, lucky enough to get a position in medical school and then lucky enough to get a position in a specialty training program, never mind a surgical training program, which is what obstetrics and gynecology is, the message was, you better not get pregnant and blow it because a man could have had this position and he would have been, you know. It was a very clear message. Uh, in, in our specialty now, when we, uh, and most of most OBGYN residents now are actually women, uh, we actively coach and counsel about when are you thinking of uh, having your pregnancies because now is the right time. And now that you're in training, you'll have maternity benefits and, and, and uh, we will, we will make whatever accommodations we need to have. And if you've had your first baby, when are you thinking of having your second baby? You need to be thinking about that. We take the responsibility on our shoulders to be helping to make it possible. I can't tell you the number of business women um, and women from other professions who I see who don't feel that support in their workplace. And this is a national tragedy because women need to feel that support. Uh, Silverman's putting on this symposium today, I think is signaling really strongly, and, and, uh, and, uh, and many companies, I think, are, are uh, saying, what can we do? What you're doing at uh, Shoppers in terms of promoting health and well-being, it's not just what your HR office is doing in terms of benefits, it's what we are thinking about, what can we do to make our workplaces healthier, um, for not just for ourselves, but for our, our younger colleagues as well. Uh, if, if we think in everything that we're doing in our daily lives, what, how can we make this a healthier place, we will be healthier. And my final word of advice is those buttons that you see on the wall that say push here to open the door, they're for disabled people or for pre people who want to end up disabled. Do not use those buttons. Open the door. Um, <laughs> If you can't open the door, go down and practice five times a morning until you can open the door. Uh, never, ever, ever let things slip. Be thinking in every moment, how can we make our, our circle of health a tighter one? I think that's excellent advice. My, one of my personal um, irritants um, in the morning is I take the GO train in from Oakville and all of the people that line up to get in the elevator instead of taking the stairs. Okay. And I walk by them and I, I one of these days, because I am, I'm not greatest in the morning, I've only had one cup of coffee, I am going to say, what is wrong with you? You know, meanwhile, there's some poor woman with a stroller or something behind who's trying to get into the elevator and these seriously, perfectly, apparently able, I mean, I could be judging and we're not to judge. 
Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, I, I, I'm sure some of those people could probably walk down the stairs. So one of the, the our um, one of our com our um, respondents said, you know, I would just like to hear a pearl of wisdom from each of the panels, and I think it's fair to say that we have an entire string of pearls of wisdom from this group today. So we do have a couple of minutes for questions. And um, we have Mike set up here in the uh, in the room. Did anybody have any questions they'd like to uh, maybe come behind the mic so that we can uh, hear you and let us know what, what your question is and uh, address it to whomever you would like? Okay. <laughs> this is um, really to, to any uh, um, of the women who want to answer this. There's been so much in the news lately about not taking a multivitamin. So for all the years between my 20s and 30s and 40s, I've heard take a multivitamin every day. And now I'm hearing don't take a multivitamin every day. And I'm completely confused. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that uh, if you look at the nutritional content and the actual value of our foods, it's definitely decreasing over the past 30 to 40 years. It's proven. The vitamins and minerals that used to be in our food though, back then are not there now because of the farming practices, the soils are depleted, the way the packages are, uh, you know, the way the foods are cooked, processed. And then we also do a lot of things every day that increase our nutrient needs. Exercise, drink coffee, drink, um, you know, uh, we're under stress. There's more pollution in the environment. So uh, I think we need more nutrients. But I think you have to look at the quality of the multivitamin. And that's really tough because uh, what you really, you really get what you pay for with supplements. So if you're taking a poor quality multivitamin, you can actually do more harm than good. For instance, if your multivitamin contains synthetic vitamin E, which would only be, you would only know if it's synthetic because vitamin E is alpha tocopherol. Well, if there's a DL dash alpha tocopherol, that's synthetic vitamin E. That does more harm than good. You need L dash alpha tocopherol. So weeding through the labels of, of, of supplements is daunting. Um, and I think that's something where you could ask a health professional or a pharmacist to direct you to a good quality multivitamin that contains um, all the nutrients in their optimal form that is natural, that's whole food based. Um, and I think it's impossible to get all your nutrients in one pill. Um, so I do think you, you can consider taking a multivitamin, but, but consider t the quality of the product. And you know, I, my pearl of wisdom, I was, gonna know, I was gonna tell you to take fish oils and vitamin B. I think it's two of the most important supplements you could take. If you had to pick something to do, I would choose that over taking a multivitamin. Interesting. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Wise, and I am a weight loss and well-being coach, and I love what you've brought out this morning. What I, my question is, the absence of coffee this morning, has it been a plant, uh, or was it an accident? And uh, if it was a plant, who of you was the brilliant person to suggest it? Well, it depends on your perspective. If you think it's good that it was a plant, then it's a plant. If you think it was bad, then it was an accident. So, <laughs> so actually, it, coffee. The evils of coffee, the good of coffee. What, what do we think about coffee? We hear a lot about that too. You know, too much, too little. Any? Uh, I think a cup a day is, is beneficial. Organic coffee is obviously more beneficial than non-organic coffee. But uh, when I was writing the second book, I tried to, I was on a detox, so I was not having coffee. For four days, I sat in front of my computer, did not write a word. <laughs> Friday morning, I got up and I said, I can't handle this anymore. I went down the street, got my lit organic coffee, came back, wrote a chapter in a day. So I think that coffee has amazing things for your brain power. But if you're trying to conceive, if you're pregnant, I don't recommend coffee. I do think that it does upset your, your hormones and it increases the risk of miscarriage if you consume too much. So, And it can raise your cholesterol if you're, raise, if you're drinking more than four cups a day. And, and it disrupts your sleep, and it can create anxiety. So definitely, you know, stick to one cup in the day and, and earlier in the, in, the, in the morning. But if you have sleep problems, maybe consider taking it out for a few weeks and see if you sleep better. Moderation, I guess. Mm -hmm. Moderation. It's always about moderation. I was just going to make a comment. Um, coffee can affect different people differently, and some people can be affected by a cup of coffee up to 12 hours. So um, having a cup of coffee is not an issue um, for most people. And there was even an interesting little blurb that just appeared in the literature, and it sort of said that um, 
there was a some kind of an association between having coffee and decreasing um, your or having a lower risk of skin cancer. Now, I am not, and I repeat, I am not saying that you drink coffee to lower your risk of skin cancer. <laughs> I'm just saying that coffee is not all bad. And so provided you're not having three, four, and five cups of coffee a day, which will make you levitate off your chair and make you irritable, um, I would fatigue. suggest, you, and more, and ultimately <laughs> probably you won't sleep that well that yeah. night, um, I'm saying it's okay to have your coffee. I love it. Thank you. Go ahead. I think I'm going to out myself here. I'm nah. actually taking Ciprolex, and something is up with my memory. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's a connection, and can you guys just sort of point me in the right direction to sort of mm -hmm. bring this back, bring my memory back where it needs to be? Yeah. Memory is complicated. It's very scary. Yeah. Yeah. Memory mm -hmm. is complicated. I, I, I think that the, the, um, the, the first thing I would say is if you're having symptoms at all on a medication, you need to take them back to the physician who prescribed them and let them know. Uh, there are medications on only uh, are can there be many complications things affect different people differently and many different things can impact memory we're not able to really give anyone specific advice on their situation here today but if the, the the most important thing as a doctor that you want is if things aren't working out as you anticipated to hear about it so you can uh, change course or, or rethink the problem mm -hmm. I had interesting. I had a discussion with my my husband about a particular medication that he's on, and he he was experiencing a side effect. And he went to his doctor, and his doctor looked it up in the book, whatever the book is, and said, "Well, only six percent of people have that side effect, so it's not likely it." And I said, "Well, who's the six percent then? I mean, I you know spend enough time around accountants to know that somebody's in that six percent. So I thought that was an interesting uh, interesting analogy. So um, do we have any? We have time for one more question. Anyone? Please. Oh, uh, you maybe two more questions. Sorry. <laughs> we'll come back to that one because I'm interested in that. <laughs> in, in general, uh, you mentioned uh, problems with sleep and how important sleep is. Is there one really important tip generally for being able to sleep through the night, especially mm -hmm. if, if you are awakened? Like I can sleep through the night, but once I wake up, if there is noise or something, it's almost impossible to get back. Is there something mm. that you advise on that? Any top tips from I'll, each of you? I'll just quickly mm -hmm. say um, that I give two remedies for sleep. I start almost every single patient that comes to my office, I start them on magnesium. Magnesium at bedtime, I start that even before calcium. So start with like 200 milligrams and keep increasing by 100 milligrams a night until you reach bowel tolerance, which means if you have loose stools in the morning, reduce the dose of the magnesium. Magnesium relaxes, your calms your nervous system, improves your sleep, reduces cravings. It just has incredible benefits on your sleep. Um, and then if you suspect that your sleep is disrupted because of stress, which is one of the most common reasons why people wake up between 2 and 4 a.m. Does anybody have that in here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then my, my suggestion is Relora. Relora is an extract of magnolia bark, and it's been proven to lower cortisol and raise the anti-aging, anti-stress hormone within two weeks. So it will help you fall asleep and stay asleep. You can take two in the morning and one at night, or sorry, two at night and one in the morning, and it helps to stabilize your cortisol levels mm -hmm. and improve the quality of broken sleep. It's very good for people that wake up and can't fall back asleep. R-E-L-O-R-A, Relora. And, and if I could add to that, I, I start with sleep hygiene, which is, I think, things that, for that, sure. that, uh, that everyone knows. Um, being awake in the middle of, of those those witching hours is very common and more common after menopause. Wine wakefulness is, is is one of the things that can contribute to that because the metabolites of alcohol actually can be stimulants. And so, if you had a nice uh, dinner with a with a couple of glasses of wine and you find yourself awake at two or three in the morning, maybe one uh, wine tolerance goes down when you hit menopause. It's just one of those sad facts of life. So, uh, so do think about that. Uh, think about think about the things that can disturb your sleep. Light pollution is a big one, um, and then there's this phenomena called spousal arousal, which is 
It's usually solved by earplugs. It's, 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 it's not the spousal arousal that the young women are experiencing. It's a different kind of... <laughs> we could talk about what happens with sex and aging. That would, that would keep us here for a whole other topic. Um, and if you do wake up in the middle of the night, however great the temptation, don't turn on the light, don't turn on the computer, don't turn on the TV, don't look at a screen. That will wake you up. Um, try to say... There's women all over this city who are awake right now, too. I'm in good company. Keep your eyes kind of half closed. And, and uh, even if you're resting, even if you're not sleeping, at least you're lying down. So don't let it stress you. Terrific. Thank you so much. I'm going to introduce now uh, Karen Slezak, who is over here. She's going to make some closing remarks. Thank you. I'm going to walk down these stairs one more time. I'm totally convinced I'm going to fall at some point. So watch Karen come up. Thank you, Susan. Good morning and uh, welcome, folks. I'm Karen Slazak, one of the tax partners with Soberman. And my practice complements today's theme of health and wellness. While we've been dialoguing today about physical and mental health and wellness, I practice in the area of financial and tax wellness. I'm part of the firm's group called SURE, which stands for Succession, Retirement, and Estate Planning. And what I like to do is provide tax checklists, checkups to help our clients ensure they remain financially healthy. So first and foremost, let me say that it's my pleasure to thank all of you for attending this morning's Women's Breakfast. We appreciate the time that you take out of your busy schedules to come in here and support our women's group. I also want to take this opportunity to thank especially our panelists who have taken a pause in their busy, busy schedules to come and lend this morning to us all these pearls of wisdom and to provide us with candid and insightful discussion. Each of you has uh, provided me personally with a number of tips and a lot of takeaways from this morning's discussion as I was writing down. I've certainly found that I can now relax and feel that as I get older, I'm going to become more content and stable. <laughs> I'm glad now that I'm seeing my personal trainer and doing a mix of cardiovascular and circuit training, and I understand the message of invest in learning to exercise properly, especially when he pushes me a little too hard in some exercises and I'm a little sore the next day. Um, around stress, about finding meaning and value in your life, I think is a message that all of us can relate to, and that stress really does help build resilience, but we need to socialize and get exercise to help balance that. I'm happy now that I have very pale skin, because being pale is good for you. <laughs> I do take my vitamin D and my fish oil, so I'm doing well. I've got a great circle of care providers looking after both mind, spirit, and body. I've got to have to give this one up, though. I do push the buttons when opening those doors. <laughs> so we'll stop that. And I've got to start sleeping in the nude, because obviously that's good for us, too. I, <laughs> my husband's going to enjoy that as well. I'm sure that every one of you also had these aha moments this morning as we heard these wonderful pearls of wisdom. And I thank our great panelists for the great job that they've done. Please let me thank them again. To thank these outstanding ladies for their time and effort they've put into their presentations, we are making a donation to each of their charities of choice. For Dr. Jennifer Blake, she has asked us to donate to Sunnybrook Health Sciences Women's and Babies Program. This program offers expert personalized care for women and their families before, during, and after pregnancy. And each year they deliver approximately 4,000 babies one quarter of which are high-risk deliveries and require specialized care for mothers and the babies. For Dr. Vera Kahoot, the Equality Effect. Equality Effect, formerly known as the African-Canadian Women's Human Rights Project, is an international network of human rights advocates, including grassroots community members, artists, musicians, filmmakers, healthcare workers, journalists, lawyers, teachers, students, and judges, who work together to improve the lives of women and girls by, by existing, sorry, by using existing human rights laws to, to achieve concrete change and meaningful empowerment of women and girls. Mouthful here. Equality Effect currently works in Ghana, Kenya, and Mali. 
Dr. Natasha Turner asked us to uh, support the Princess Margaret Hospital Foundation and their Cancer Research Fund, great cause. They raise over $70 million annually to support breakthrough research and patient care and education programs of Princess Margaret Hospital, Canada's leading research hospital, uh, cancer research hospital. And finally, for Mary Busick, not last but at least, the Hospital for Sick Children's Mother Risk. Created in 1985, Mother Risk is a clinical research and teaching program at the Hospital for Sick Children and provides information and guidance to pregnant or lactating women and to healthcare professionals regarding the risk to the fetus from exposure to drugs, chemicals, disease, radiation, and environmental agents. So that's where we'd like to say thank you to all of you once again. Now I'd like to call on an assistant from our insolvency practice, if Julia Reznichenko would please come up. What we're going to do now is award our door prizes and our, our survey prizes. You can help me. I'm going to let you pull the, the names from the hat. Um, as most of you are aware, as uh, Susan mentioned, we conducted an online survey and had close to 100 participants. And we asked many of you to put your name in for our draw. Thank you very much for everyone who participated in the survey because your insights were able to provide us with several of the statistics you saw on this morning's screen as well as helping us to prioritize today's panel discussion. The first prizes that we're drawing from are being presented courtesy of Soberman. And our first and grand prize is a health and wellness package valued at $200. The package consists of a new Lululemon Triumph tote bag with some beauty products as well as a copy of the supercharged hormone diamond by Dr. Natasha Turner. <laughs> The blank. Yeah. And our winner is Fatima Sadat. Yes, we will find her. <laughs> We've also got a copy of Dr. Turner's book, The Supercharged Hormo Diet. So we'll raffle that one next. <laughs> Is Gail Freelander here? Yay! <laughs> now recently we had an event that had a theme of hot and spicy culinary gifts, so we have two of those gift packages to raffle as well this morning. They contain spices, past uh, Canadian kitchen utensils and a cookbook, so. Thank you. Lorna Yates. Okay, so I'll pull that one for Lorna. Nancy Coltham. Well, this is a tough one here, folks. <laughs> All right. Then we'll move on to our door prizes. Uh, and thank you very much, everyone, who put your cards in for the door prize. Is there anyone else who may have anything else that they didn't get their name cards into? Okay. Thank you, though. While we're getting those names um, for each of you, we'd like to say thank you to our event sponsors and event par our partners this morning. Should I pick those? Okay. Clear Medicine Wellness Boutique, Golf Town, Healthcare 365, the Psychological Foundation of Canada, RG Graphics and Printing, Rogers Consumer Publishing, and of course, Shoppers Drug Mart. Without their help and support, they, we wouldn't be able to make this morning uh, the morning that it's been. And they've presented the, the following gift baskets for us to hand out as well. The first is a spa manicure gift basket valued at $175, courtesy of Shoppers Drug Mart. <laughs> Liz Nash. 
of Nash and Nash. Our second package ties in with today's theme. It's an anti-aging and skin care gift basket valued at $200, again, courtesy of our friends at Shoppers Drug Mart. I pronounce this right. Cynthia Carroll. And finally, our last package is from Rogers Consumer Publishing, who have generously donated an ultimate beauty and healthcare package, complete with a year subscription to a magazine of your choice, numerous cosmetics, and other products to treat yourself to. This package is valued at $150. Our lucky winner is Debbie Fang with Daniel's Capital. Thank you. Now, we don't want anyone to go away empty handed, so, as you noticed on your chairs this morning, you've received a package that contains a number of tools and goodies that have been made available by our event sponsors. And let's just give a round of applause to thank them again. So thank you again for attending. It's been a pleasure as always to share this morning with you. An email inviting you to participate in a short evaluation will be sent to you in the next few days. We welcome your comments and hope you'll incorporate them in our future events. And hope to see you all next year at our Women's for Women event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.